Washington, D.C. as well, which is where we catch up this morning with Alareza Jafarzada, the deputy director of the National Council of Resistance of Iran and the author of The Iran Threat. And uh, certainly Iran is a topic that has uh, come up and will come up more and more as uh, as uh, the months and weeks go along. So our conversation presented by Marcus and Mac voted best law firm and best personal injury lawyer three years in a row in the best of Indiana County contest. You can visit them online at marcusandmac.com. Alareza, good morning. Good morning, Todd. A great pleasure to speak uh, with you this morning. Well, it's good to have you on the air with us because I, I'm guessing that not a lot of people really understand the depth and the roots of our difficulties with Iran and uh, and how it is germane to uh, to America, uh, and that uh, Iran is is really the major player in the unrest in the Middle East. Absolutely, Todd, um, and I think it's extremely important for everyone to understand that because this is not an you know alien issue somewhere in the Middle East, the Iran regime has uh, for years uh, acted as the head of the stake of war and terror uh, in the region. It's the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism and a major violator of human rights. It's developing uh, uh, nuclear weapons. It has a very advanced, sophisticated uh, missile program. It has been funding and training all these uh, terror proxies in the region. But the good news is that the regime is highly isolated among its own population. This is a regime that has been rejected by the people of Iran. A vast majority of them are opposed to it. Um, since 2018, there have been nine rounds of major uprisings in Iran that engulf all 31 provinces of the country, people calling for change. They're uh, chanting, death to the, the oppressor, be it the Shah or the supreme leader, rejecting any form of the dictatorship, whether it was the previous, uh, you know, the Shah's monarchy dictatorship or the current theocracy. They say, we want freedom, we want democracy, we want a republic form of government where the vote of the people will count, and they want separation of religion and state. And, and imagine what a difference it would make if um, Iran, instead of being the head of the state of the war and terror, it's now, it will become a center of uh, democracy, religious tolerance, coexistence with its uh, neighbors, um, and it will change the entire face of the Middle East, if not, you know, everywhere else in the world. And that's, I think, how it's really directly related uh, to even the United States, you know, thousands of miles away, all the Western nations, all the countries in the region, but most importantly to the people of Iran who have paid a, a very, very high price over the years to bring about change in Iran. Well, if Iran is the major exporter of state terror, and it has been identified as such by, by many, many different entities, um, is, is that the main obstacle to, to getting the separation that uh, is needed in that country so that the will of the people actually holds forth uh, and the regime is toppled? Well, you know, honestly speaking, Todd, uh, even though many countries around the world recognize that the Iran regime using its the, uh, uh, military arm known as the Revolutionary Guards and a specific force uh, known as the Quds Force that does terrorism, even though they recognize that, but they're not willing to pay the price um, in standing on the side of the people of Iran to bring about change. No one is asking for, you know, U.S. intervention or boots on the ground or even appropriating money. All the, um, the Iranian people are asking is don't give money and resources to the Iranian regime. Don't try to appease them, because when you appease a dictator, you just make it worse. If you give money to terrorists who are abducting your people and uh, it just, you know, it just further flourishes terrorism, it further encourages the regime to get more, more hostages for, you know, higher prices. Uh, so that's why uh, we feel that situation has to change. And, and if people thought that by appeasing the regime, by giving them money and resources, they may be able to tame the behavior of the regime. I think since that last year, we, what we've seen in the region has removed any doubts. And 
they need to focus. And I think Congress is on the right side, um, you know, in a very bipartisan way. Both the House and the Senate are looking at the people of Iran. They're looking at the organized uh, resistance. Uh, interestingly, as misogynist as the Iran regime is, the opposition is actually led by women. You know, the, the lead uh, um, head of the, the president-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, which is the parliament in Asia, is a woman. She has proposed a, a 10-point plan for the future of Iran that relies on separation of religion and state, um, gender equality, freedom of the press, freedom of political parties, freedom of religion, uh, a free market economy, uh, peace in the Middle East, and, you know, non-nuclear uh, Iran. That's the kind of sentiment that the people of Iran have, and that's how it's going to be really very helpful and useful for the whole region. We just need to get the policy corrected on the right side, and that's all we need to do. And, you know, I know it's a tough task to do, but I think we're in the right direction, uh, as members of Congress have done. And we need to emphasize, uh, I think, all the uh, U.S. citizens, anywhere they are, they have a voice among the members of Congress uh, to remind them that they need to stand on the side of the people, not the regime. Well, that will make a huge difference. One of the major difficulties in that respect is um, the fact that Iran has influence, uh, even within our U.S. government. Uh, uh, there is a woman named Ariana Tabatabai, uh, who has been identified as an agent of the Iranian regime, uh, who is not only a part of our Defense Department, but has actually uh, been uh, promoted uh, to uh, an even higher position within our U.S. government, within the administration. Uh, and, uh, and here she is um, with security clearance number one. She's been identified as... Uh, perhaps, and, and very likely the person responsible for leaking those Israeli secrets to Iran a couple of weeks ago. Um, how, do, how does that happen in this country? Well, you know, Todd, this is what I was talking about earlier. I mean, this is like the latest example. You know, there is a culture built over the years here, but also in other con- countries in Europe as well, that, you know, it's a culture of appeasement. It's a culture of concessions. That if you're nice to the Iran regime, if you give them something, if you give them openings, if you give them access, if you build a relationship with the, with the mullahs, the clerics, um, then that would help, um, you know, eliminate some of the problems and everything. This uh, woman you mentioned, Ariane Tabatabai, is a, is a, is a perfect example of, of, uh, of that culture that is in this country. You know, in, um, in March of 2014, a decade ago, um, she met in Europe with two um, with an Iranian official, along with another um, uh, person of uh, Iranian origin, and the Iranian regime basically recruited her and getting her agreement to create what they called Iran Expert Initiative (IEI) um, that would basically push. Uh, the agenda for Tehran and the uh, the Iran regime agent and this this woman Arianta Tabatabai agreed to be the core group of the um, IEI. Uh, just uh, three months later, in June of 2014, she travels to Tehran and you know meets with all the Iranian officials and you know makes all the coordinations and, and everything. Um, and then um, a month after that, um, in July of 2014, uh, Tabatabai Tabai contacts her Iranian handler, who is an official with the Minister of um, Foreign Affairs of the Iran regime, about her dual invitations to events in Saudi Arabia and Israel. And she was told that, uh, you know, she should avoid going to Israel. And then, you know, she basically uh, took guidance from her regime handlers by following up with, you know, basically saying, oh, thank you very much for your advice. I will take action regarding Saudi Arabia and keep you updated on the progress. So it's like a two-way communication between her and the Iran regime. And interestingly, uh, you know, a month later, in August of that year, she put out an article out of the blue in the national interest attacking 
the Iranian opposition, calling the Iranian opposition as, you know, uh, as terrorists, that there's no viable alternative to the Ayatollahs in Tehran. These are not, you know, things happening by accident. She was pushing the agenda for the Iran regime. She was making fun of those protesters in Iran who were yearning for freedom, uh, calling it a joke. She built this perception. She helped build in the perception that there is no alternative, that there's no future for those protesters in Iran. Therefore, they need to find a way of working with the regime. She, for many years, was like promoting this ridiculous idea that there is a religious decree, a fatwa, by the supreme leader that they would never develop nuclear weapons. This is ridiculous. The entire nuclear weapons uh, has always been about building the bombs. So you can see how someone under the cover of expert um, with, with clear ties to the Iranian regime was promoting the agenda for Tehran. And now, instead of you know, being held accountable for those things, uh, she's now, she gets security clearance. She, she was part of the nuclear negotiating team um, you know, that started the negotiations again with, on the nuclear issue in 2020. And later she ended up, first she was at the State Department, then she ended up at the uh, DOD. This is just one example that, you know, when you don't have the right approach, if you don't have the right policy, you open up yourself to these kind of influences, infiltration, and uh, uh, by, by uh, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, in this case, the Iran regime. We need to end that, uh, and we need to look at the people of Iran and look at the possibility for change from within. He is Ala Reza Jafarzada, the Deputy Director of the National Council of Resistance of Iran. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. It's a really, really important topic. We're going to have to become much more educated about it. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Todd. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Always a pleasure.